All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation, special edition of Knicks Fan TV. We are just a few days away from the NBA trade deadline, so I'm sure a lot of Knicks fans, this is an an anxious time when fans are awaiting the fate of the orange and blue and which direction they will go in. We'll also talk about some potential deals on the horizon around the league, and uh, I want to go a little bit behind the scenes of the trade deadline. I wanted a GM's perspective on all of this, and that's why I brought in a friend of the program. He was the assistant general manager of the Boston and Celtics when they won the championship in the 2007 and 8 season. He was also the general manager of the Phoenix Suns for five seasons beginning the 2013 season. Uh, He also covers the NBA for Odyssey Sports as well as you can catch him on NBA TV uh, talking through the trade deadline on February 10th and that is Ryan McDonough. Ryan, thanks again for joining. How are you doing today? CP, I'm doing great. It's always good to be on with you. And it seems impossible that we're more than halfway through the NBA season. We're staring at the trade deadline next week. But uh, here we are again. And uh, guys like you and I, I think this is um, you know, like a playground for us this time. You were in heaven breaking down all these potential deals. Uh, Knicks fans love it. It's the trade deadline draft, you know, all, all the acquisitions and potential acquisitions that they, they definitely eat it up. So uh, thanks for joining us. And, you know, as we talk today, we have this Knicks team that's Vastly underachieving at the time of this recording, they are uh, 23 and 28, sitting in 12th in the East. And as the trade deadline, as the trade deadline goes, they we're hearing rumors and rumblings about one Julius Randle potentially being uh, on the trading block. You know, coming off of the season that he had, signing the the max deal or close to max deal. You know, what do you make of these rumors surrounding Randle right now in the team? Well, obviously, it's been a disappointing year for Randall and the Knicks. I think it's one of these things that's easier to see in hindsight, CP, where when you overshoot on the upside, like the Knicks did last year, where they played so well and everything clicked and it went almost perfectly uh, with Tom Thibodeau coming in, giving the team discipline, significantly improving the squad, especially on the defensive end. When you have Julius Randall, uh, who had been criticized early in his career and, and bounced around, obviously, between Lakers, New Orleans, uh, for finally, you know, find a home in, in New York. York, everything looked bright. But the problem is when you overachieve to that level, you're set up to take a step back. And, and that's where, um, you know, I, I think it's it's hard for some of us to look at it objectively sometimes, especially when you're a fan of the team. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, CP, to be honest, it reminds me of my second year as GM of the Phoenix Suns, where the first year we won 48 games. We had a number of guys have career years that is still tied for the best record ever by a team who didn't make the playoffs for 48 and 34, which tells you how good the Western conference was uh, at that time in 2014. But I bring it up because you look at it as an executive and try to take the emotion out of it. And you say, shoot, we're going to come down. You know, even if, even if we we bring back the same guys, uh, we're going to come down. So I I think the gravity is setting into some extent with the New York Knicks with Randall in particular, I'd be personally a little bit surprised if they trade him. I know there's some friction and tension between Randall and the franchise, but I think he's probably still more valuable to the, Knicks than most other franchises and obviously as an executive CP or just you know with the franchise in general you do not want to sell when when the value is low obviously I think that goes without saying but Randall's value today is not where it was a year ago it's not even where it was last offseason after he had a terrific year Uh, so my guess is they'll try to obviously play better rebuild Randall's value and then see if they can play better over the last third of the season and sneak into the plan. Yeah, and as you say, you know, the expectations are ratcheted up after you have that magical season like they had 41 wins fourth in the East. Now, there's some in the fan base who say, well, you know, looking at Randall's production here and, and him falling off from, from last year, they, they say, well, why did the front office rush to sign him to that deal? Why not let it play out, let it go into free agency and then decide from there? Um, from a general manager's perspective, How do you, you know, weigh that those decisions where a guy's having a hell of a year, he's an all-star, he's most improved player, he's getting votes for all NBA, all NBA defense. You know, how do you consider that when you you look at roster construction and building for your future? Yeah, great question. And this is where the salary cap and the CBA really come into play, uh, CP, because I think one of the big misperceptions sometimes is if, say, a 20 plus million dollar player walks out the door that you can replace him with a 20 plus million dollar player. It it doesn't always work that way. That's the first issue, right? The cap space is significant and the Knicks, uh, you know, are going to operate as an over the cap team, at least for the immediate future, especially given some of the contracts they signed last offseason. You know, Evan Fournier, Alec Burks, Derek Rose, Nerlens Noel. Uh, So I bring it up. The difference could not be uh, between do we want Julius Randle or another guy who's uh, maybe a borderline 
borderline all-star has made the all-star team and you know top 50 player in the league it could be uh, do we want Julius Randle or an exception guy or a minimum guy you, you know that that's that's what it is financially um, so uh, I, I was a fan of the extension at the time. I, I still, you know, think it's it's a fine extension. Obviously, again, his value, as we all know, isn't what what it was a year ago today. Um, but but that can change. As you know, things change quickly in the NBA. Um, you know, ba- based on team play. I look at a team like the Atlanta Hawks, where they're certainly feeling differently about their team, and I think some of their individual players than they were three or four weeks ago when they, when they were badly underachieving. Um, so I, so I think Julius, you know, will be in New York. Um, and, and one of the trends, and one of the things that. Leon Rose and Scott Perry uh, have told people about the Knicks is um, they're going to try to um, draft and develop and, and trade and incrementally improve their team that way. They're not banking on what the Knicks have banked on in the recent past. And as you know, CP, better than anybody that's gotten the Knicks in trouble, especially in 2019, uh, banking on one or two superstars um, saying, I want to go to New York and the Knicks blow open a ton of cap space. We saw what happened in 2019 when, when Kyrie and KD went across the river to Brooklyn. So I think it's a wise strategy. Now it's a difficult strategy because you kind of have to climb that ladder rung by rung. You know, there's no elevator that takes you to the top like Kevin Durant or, um, you know, some superstar coming to your franchise, um, you know, would do. But uh, this is the NBA. If you look at the just the stars around the league, put, put the Knicks aside, but if you look at the superstars around the league, as the salary cap goes up and up and the contract's gets so big CP very few players are turning down you know 40 50 million dollar deals even looking ahead some of these guys like James Harden besides a five-year max deal he might be be making 60 plus million dollars five years from now So, so the money is insane and I bring it up because I think that'll put more onus on the trade market in particular. Uh, and then obviously drafting and developing is always important to your franchise. But but I think now the NBA is less about free agency than it has been, at least in the recent past. Uh, teams don't have cap space and, and the superstars aren't hitting free agency for the most part. They're taking the money. And then the new trend CP, as you know, is if they're unhappy after they have the money, then they ask for a trade. And, and that's why I didn't necessarily mind the way they went about this offseason season you know, running it back and, and signing to these guys to, yeah, multi-year deals, but also with team team options, which I thought gave them some flexibility if they right. wanted to, you know, pursue a sign and trade down the road. But just given the fact that it just didn't seem like a lot of these stars were really going to hit the open market, I just felt like it was, it was probably best for them to continue on this path in terms of how they construct their roster. Hasn't worked out that well so far, but, you know, I, I, I just didn't mind it. Yeah, I liked it better. I was covering the free agency period live for NBA TV. And when I thought they were straight for your contracts, I, I didn't like it. I'll be I'll be honest with you. But then when I saw the team option uh, after year three, which team option team controls it, it's their decision um, that makes it easier to trade them. And historically, from my 15 plus years experience, CP on the team side now doing three or so on the media side, usually with two years left on a player's contract, uh, two guarantees years left, even if the player underachieves, as long as the contract's not a disaster, other teams will listen, right? Maybe he's not the centerpiece of a deal, but they will listen to it. So I bring it up because um, that is the position the Knicks will be in this offseason. They're not in it now, but, uh, you know, if, if you think, um, you know, Evan Fournier or Burks or Rose, uh, you know, these guys who got longer deals, um, you know, are untradeable, um, that gets easier uh, with two years left. And then obviously it gets progressively easier the closer to the end of that deal you get, especially as an expiring contract. Um, so I, I feel badly for the Knicks. I, it seems like they've been snake bitten a lot of ways. Everything that kind of went right last year has seemingly gone wrong this year, starting with Derrick Rose. Of all the contracts, if I look at all the free agent contracts they signed this offseason, I think Rose was the best. He's obviously played great. He's having a late career renaissance in New York. He's embraced the franchise. The fans and the franchise embraced him. He, he's been injured. Uh, and I think that's a you know big part of the reason the Knicks are, uh, what, 12th in the Eastern Conference and yeah. underachieving through the first two-thirds of the season. Struggling big, big time and definitely missing Rose. Uh, now, the the prevailing rumor right now surrounding Julius Randle is, is a potential swap uh, for De'Aaron Fox. We, we did know, we did learn that, you know, the Kings have been very aggressive in this trade market. They were high on Ben Simmons, looking for somebody that can really change this, this franchise's fortunes around. Um, what would what do you think about a potential Randall for Fox swap and, and how that could potentially help both teams? And Sacramento was one of the teams that I'm most interested in over the next week or so, CP up until the deadline. Uh, they have a, a decent amount of backcourt talent, but an unbalanced roster. If you look at the roster, uh, De'Aaron Fox is a max player who you just mentioned. Uh, I think Tyrese Halliburton is the guy that they value the highest, uh, given his age and contract and productivity. 
Uh, he's played very well. Um, so I, I think they'd actually be more likely to put Fox in a deal than they would Halliburton. And then uh, Davion Mitchell, the rookie they drafted out of Baylor, a good player, good defender, a little bit undersized. And then Buddy Heel, who I, I don't think it's you know secret, Buddy's been on the trade market for the last uh, couple of years. You know, excellent shooter, limited in other ways. Most teams I talk to think uh, you know they'd be fine having Buddy Heel on the roster, uh, but he's overpaid for, for rel- relative to what he does. Obviously, famously or infamously now in Sacramento and LA, the deal uh, with Heel potentially going from Sacramento to the Lakers fell apart at the one yard line. In fact, that was a deal that Sacramento Kings thought they were going to do and didn't. So I, I bring it up because I think Sacramento was going to be active. Um, you know, th- that deal I think would make some sense uh, for both teams. Uh, it would allow Sacramento to, to keep Halliburton. Um, you know, obviously when, when you're trying to allot minutes and, and put Hallib- the ball in Halliburton's hands, develop Davion Mitchell, uh, having Randall, you know, as, as a secondary front court playmaker, um, you know, playing off of those guys would make a lot more sense. Uh, so, I, so I think it makes sense from that perspective. And then from the Knicks perspective, uh, I think a lot of it, for me, would come down to Fox's health. He's a really talented player. Um, you know, he's one of the best in the league, maybe the best in the league CP when he's healthy in transition. I mean, he, yeah. he is a, a blur, you, you know, getting getting the ball uh, on the break uh, off of defensive rebounds and just pushing it. Um, now, the, the questions Leon Rose and Scott Perry and their group have to have with Tom Thibodeau is that has historically not been the way Tom has played, right? Let's lead the league in pace and, and try to run teams out of the gym. Uh, as you know, it's, it's usually slower, more yeah. controlled, more methodical defensive focused. But that being said, the Knicks need a boost. Uh, they're, they're in the bottom third of the league in offensive efficiency. Uh, so I, I think it makes sense just from an age and talent perspective uh, and just, you know, say, look, we're, we're going to get Fox. Uh, we're going to have RJ Barrett, uh, all these all these young studs, um, you know, Grimes uh, quickly and just go. We're just going to try to run teams out of the gym and think we can defend well enough. So uh, I like it from a talent perspective, uh, but I'd be interested to see what Tom Thibodeau thinks about Fox and, and totally reshaping the way the team plays. It is an intriguing fit, as you said, because Fox is a guy who's, you know, he's he's a turbo out there. He wants to go out there and push the pace. I think the Knicks would benefit from that, especially uh, when you look at R.J. Barrett in the starting lineup. I feel like part of the the issues with the current starting lineup is that they play a bit too slow. And when he's out there, when he's getting the rebounds, he's out on the break. He, he likes to push. You have Obi Toppin as well, who I think could benefit from that. Quentin Grimes also plays. You know, I think Grimes is... is um, comfortable in, in either situation, but I think he's a guy that can also excel in a more up-tempo scheme. So it, it's interesting to see how that would fit with Tibbs. They are 23rd in offense, you know, 29th in the, in the league in assists. Um, Fox would give us that that downhill uh, point guard, but it's just an interesting fit uh, how he would how he would mesh with uh, with RJ Barrett and the like. Now, I, again, the team did go out. They got Evan Fournier. Uh, They got Kemba Walker. They re-signed Rose. They re-signed a lot of veterans, a lot of guys who are playing in in Tom Thibodeau's rotation, but it hasn't been working out. They do have the youth, as you said, you know, they went out and got a a Cam Reddish. You know, from a GM's perspective, when you go out and make these acquisitions and and you're investing in these guys for at least two years, some three, what, what, what are some of the things that you consider where you're saying, okay, do we peel this thing back? and focus on the youth or do we have patience with this group right here and, and seize it, see this thing through at least for, you know, a little bit of time. How, how do you like play those weigh those odds options? Yeah, honestly, CP, it almost all depends on ownership. You know, how, how patient is James Dolan willing to be, you know, the history of the franchise better than anyone and what the, what the Knicks fans have been through the last couple of decades, uh, especially when you, when you think you have it. And, and I think, Twice in the last decade, maybe two decades, Knicks, Knicks have thought they've had it in the upswing. Uh, once was in 2013 when, when I was in the Celtics front office and actually interviewing for the Suns GM job. And the Knicks with Carmelo Anthony, uh, Amon Schumper, Jason Kidd, and those guys really beat us up pretty good in the first round of the playoffs. That was the end of Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce era. Uh, and then the second time was obviously last year, a year ago. Mm-hmm. And so, so I preface it that way because uh, I think it, it's hard emotionally um, and, 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 and logically for an owner to say, okay, well, I know, you know, we won 41 games last year, as you mentioned, uh, we're, we're, you know, competitive in the playoffs. Uh, we had a relatively young team. We do have some young guys and, and Barrett quickly and uh, others who are Mitchell Robinson, who are contributing. So let's, let's try to go up. Let's not try to go down. The Knicks have been down, uh, you, you know, some, some intentional, most of it not intentionally for the last couple of decades. Uh, so, so I, I think that's unlikely where they, pull the plug again, uh, you know, rebuild through the draft and all that. I think it's more likely they try to, uh, you know, fight their way out of this hole. Now, now the challenge CP, you know, being honest with you, looking at the Eastern conference is 
I don't know who in the top 10 they would surpass in the short term, like over the last third of this season, uh, because the teams in the ninth and 10th slot, uh, I think, are two of the more talented teams in Eastern Conference, Boston and Atlanta, who have also underachieved this year. Um, so, so I think, you know, but, but, but that, that aside, I, I think they will try to continue to get better, right? And so whether it's a Randall for Fox, whether it's upgrading around the periphery, whether it's trading a draft pick uh, for Cameron Reddish, I think they'll try to make moves like that rather than pull the plug, let's go into the lottery and hope the ping pong balls bounce our way and you know take a few years to develop those guys. I think it's more um, you know being aggressive even in terms of using young players or draft picks, assets, to try to improve the team in the short term. Yeah. And that's why, you know, and I look at a guy like a Tibbs who, and you, because the fans are saying it's not working right now, let's go young, let's go young. We have all these kids here. Let's just see them. And my perspective is you have a coach who had just won 41 games the prior year made the playoffs. I would have to think that he wants to continue on that trek and not, you know, pull this thing back and, and and start from scratch. And then, as you said, the owner uh, from the owner's perspective, you know, uh, you as, as a general manager, do you ever feel like there's pressure to kind of validate the investments, the acquisitions that you made as you're trying to sell to the owner? You know, these are the pieces that are going to make us a good team rather than reversing course again. Oh, sure. No, I, I think that pressure is always there uh, from the front office, as you mentioned, justifying the players you brought in, either uh, whether you signed them as free agents, drafted them or traded for them. Uh, and then from the coach to show and his staff to show they're maximizing the talent on the roster. Uh, and then from the players themselves to, to show that they're li- not only living up to the contract, but obviously trying to outperform their contract and get a bigger deal uh, or not get trade and or not get traded, you know, whatever their motivations are to find a home and stick with the franchise for a while. Uh, so, yeah, it's not something that's discussed a lot, I think, in NBA circles, but everybody's aware of it, you, you know, that, um, you know, if, if uh, Leon Rose and Scott Perry to go to James Dolan, today and say, let's tear this thing down over the next week and, uh, you know, sell, spin off Randall and, and maybe Rose and some of the veteran guys get draft picks and young players. Uh, my guess is that wouldn't be very well received. And, and so that's why I don't think they would do it. I, I think it's more likely, uh, well, you know, and, and I think they give you a hint of what they may do over the next week or so with the reddish deal, uh, that was a draft pick for a player. Now, a young player, but but not a 19-year-old rookie, a guy who's been in the league for a couple of years. Um, now, I, I think one of the things they need to rectify CP is, You know, it seemed like what Tom Thibodeau said is, you know, Reddish is out of the rotation. He's got to earn his way into the rotation is different than what the front office had in mind. If you're going to give up value, if you're going to give up a first round pick for a young player, especially as that player is approaching being extension eligible, I think this offseason, then if he doesn't get extended this offseason unrestricted free agency, um, you don't give up value for a player in season, especially a young player on a team that's under 500. And, and have that healthy, if that player's healthy, have him not play. So, so I think that's something that, uh, you know, Leon and, and Scott and West in the front office and Tom and his coaching staff need to work out, if not now, over the all-star break. Hey, look, we gave up value to get this guy, it, whether it's unanimous or not, organizationally, we made a decision to get Reddish. How are we going to put our arm around Reddish and how are we going to put Cam in a position to be successful over the last 25 or 30 games of the season? I think that should be a priority regardless of what happens or doesn't happen between now and the trade deadline. Is there Ever a time where, you know, you have a guy in the trading block, is there an advantage to, because if you look at the Knicks right now and they're struggling, they're, they're losing, and a lot of their new acquisitions have been having up and down seasons. Is there a thought where if we continue to play this guy, his trade value is going to diminish versus does the coach potentially bench him here? And, and you know, we kind of, you know, keep it a mystery, so to speak, as to you know, what the other what the other buyer is is uh, getting here in the deal. From my experience, it's almost always the case that uh, the teams thinking about acquiring a player want to see that player play. In fact, you almost I don't say you need to see the, t- the player play. But if the player is not playing and he's healthy, um, you say, well, if he's not good enough to play for the 23 or 24 and 28 Knicks, whatever the Knicks record is, why would we want to give up a lot of value for him, right? If he can't play for them, why, why would we want him? So, so I think uh, sometimes you see the opposite of that CP where it's almost like a showcase, a guy who is out of the rotation or has gotten limited minutes, the team kind of thrusts him out there and hopes he does well, try to put that guy in position to be successful um, because, you know, it, it is human nature. Evaluators is another team. The thought or the hope is that they see the guy playing and playing well and they say, okay, that, that guy's better than I thought. I saw him play well, you know, last night or last week or whatever the case may be. I'm more willing to give up value uh, because if he's out of the rotation and 
And we're not talking about, you know, Phoenix or Golden State or one of the top teams in the league who have kind of rock solid rotations and they're rolling through the uh, first two thirds of the season. Then there, there's some, you know, internal red flags about wh- why isn't he playing for them and why are they so eager to move on from this guy, given that, uh, you know, as you discussed, the teams in the bottom third of the league in offensive efficiency and, uh, you know, toward the bottom in, in the bottom third of the league uh, in terms of the standings in the Eastern Conference. Now, uh, another prospect that uh, has been linked to the Knicks, uh, his father used to play for the Knicks, playing very well for the Dallas Mavericks, man, having a career year, and that is uh, Jalen Brunson. Uh, what do you think about, you know, how Dallas handles the Brunson situation? He's, he's going to be going into free agency this year. They have lost Tim Hardaway Jr. to the foot injury. They're in the middle of a playoff race. Uh, what do you think about the uh, a potential Jalen Brunson acquisition? This is a very interesting one, especially for fans of the collective bargaining agreement and the salary cap. Um, I can't remember a first round pick, excuse me, a second round pick CP ever getting four guaranteed years. And and the reason you don't do that as a franchise is because you want to avoid the situation the Dallas Mavericks are going to be in this summer. Right. So if if, um, they gave him three years guaranteed and then either, um, you know, team option or no option, just three years. Uh, on his contract, which is negotiable for second round picks, then he would have been a restricted free agent. Well, since they gave him four years now, he clears that restricted hurdle and he's unrestricted. So yeah, I I have no doubt the Knicks have a lot of interest. Um, And think of the ties too, with with Jalen personally to Leon Rose, who was his agent with CAA, uh, Rick Brunson, his dad was was, um, Leon's first client, and then Tom Thibodeau uh, and, and Jalen Brunson's father, uh, Rick are very close as well. So uh, all the ties there. Uh, also, the guy's a really good player. I mean, he's, you know, you talk about uh, a young player, CP, who I view as a coach on the floor, mm-hmm. uh, you know, can think the game. We saw it at Villanova. There were doubts about whether his athleticism or lack thereof would translate to the NBA. Well, he's not the most athletic guy, but he's really smart. He's tough. He can shoot. He can pass. He doesn't make mistakes. He's yeah. somewhat of a savant on the court. So he's going to be in demand in free agency. Uh, I don't think he wants to give the Mavs a discount, which I fully understand. I mean, playing first four years of career at a high level, basically on a minimum contract or slightly above. Um, but, but the challenge for the Knicks is, you know, I don't think they're going to be able to blow open 20, $25 million in cap right. space. They'd have to unload so many pieces. Uh, so then it becomes, uh, if Brunson does have his heart set on getting to New York, what do the Knicks have uh, in terms of satisfying the Mavericks in a sign and trade? And is Dallas willing to play play ball with an over the cap Knicks team, or do they take a hard line and say, no, we want Brunson back and we are not going to participate in a sign and trade to get Brunson to his preferred destination. Going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, One of the biggest, biggest stars of this trade deadline. He's been on the sidelines all season long so far is Ben Simmons. How do you see this Ben Simmons uh, saga playing out? I, I just hope it ends soon. CP. <laughs> I think we're all tired of it. Uh, no, in, in all sincerity, I think they should trade him over the next week or so. And I know what Daryl Morey in the front office in Philadelphia said, they want a top 25 player. Uh, Executives I talked to around the league, CP, debate whether Ben Simmons himself, when he's healthy and playing, is a top 25 player. So so I I don't think Philadelphia is going to get a top 25 player, a guy that you and I would consider uh, a top 25 player for Ben Simmons. But I don't think that should necessarily be the bar either. I understand why you put it out from a leverage posturing, negotiating standpoint. But at the end of the day, especially if you look at uh, going back to Phoenix and Golden State, the best teams, um, they have depth. They they have talent, obviously, at the high end of the roster, but they also have depth and they don't have a ton of holes. You you know, there aren't aren't a lot of weak links in the chain. So so when when you're Philadelphia and you have Joel Embiid, who's uh, a unique talent and even expanded his game again this year, I've marveled. I'm sure you've watched him play a bunch, you know, in, in the Eastern Conference, the Atlantic Division. Um, the skill that that guy has, he, you know, 7'2", uh, 270, whatever he is, to get a defensive rebound. He's added the ball handling now where he just brings up the court and, uh, you know, shoots shots off the dribble, initiates offense. I think most fans would be amazed if they stood next to MB just to see how big that dude is, you know, what he does with the skill at that size. So I bring it up because you have a guy who, in my opinion, is in the top two. I personally have Nikola Jokic slightly ahead in the MVP voting, but clearly he's in the top three to five and MVP. Uh, the team has remained toward the top of the Eastern Conference uh, with Simmons playing zero games. Um, right. So I, I think they owe it to him to try to, you know, maximize uh, the value and in, in, in not necessarily the value of Simmons, but the prime and extend the prime and maximize the prime of Embiid. Uh, that's why a deal, um, you know, we, we put together yesterday with I'm doing some teaching now with Sports Business Classroom, uh, something like CJ McCollum, Anthony Simons, and Nasir Little. And Portland just made a trade today, but I'm not involving any of those guys. Uh, for Simmons, I think would make a lot of sense for both teams. When Lillard's healthy, you get Simmons as a secondary playmaker in Portland playing off of Lillard. 
maximizes strengths, minimizes weaknesses. And then uh, from the um, Philly perspective, you know, they would get three players, um, McCollum, who's, you know, maybe slightly overpaid, but an elite shooter, lead offensive player, uh, an up and comer in Simons, who's maybe, you know, most improved player this year in that mix. And then Nasir Little played very well. I think that kind of deal, it's maybe not what Philadelphia had in mind, but um, nobody's handled this situation well, CP, uh, including the player, the franchise, the agency, nobody's handled it well. Uh, and a player's value when he's not playing, especially, frankly, when the team is playing relatively well, that actually hurts his value to some extent. And other teams, the other 29 teams are saying, well, how good is Ben Simmons if Philly's still a top team without him? And how much value should we give up for him, given all the issues he's had with the 76ers? I, I totally agree on that, you know, based on Philly's success. And then on top of the fact that I feel like there's question marks about Ben Simmons. You know, what is his true yeah. role in the NBA? Can he shoot a jump shot? You know, where is he mentally? I just feel like him sitting on the sidelines here, as you said, is, could potentially have, have hurt his trade value. Now, whether or not he, I don't, I don't know if he's going to get traded at the deadline. I just have a feeling that James Harden really wants to make his way to Philly, man. I, I just have a feeling that a potential sign and trade blockbuster move between the Nets and the Sixers in this offseason is, is where these two ultimately um, land. What, what do you think about the Nets and, and their potential uh, issues here? Harden hasn't played well. You have the Kyrie Irving part-time situation. Both guys could be pending free agents. How do, how do you see the Nets situation playing out? Well, it's a, it's a mess in the short term. I mean, ever since Kevin Durant got injured, uh, Kyrie not being vaccinated, all the issues you know we've had there. Uh, James Harden's play has fluctuated. His, his attitude lately uh, seems to be poor. I, I guess as we record this show, he's not playing against Utah tonight, so he's out in the short term. Um, and one of the things I, I looked at, CP, with the, the Brooklyn Nets, who uh, were, were – uh, Full disclosure, they were my preseason pick, uh, you know, to win an NBA championship. And this is before the Kyrie vaccination stuff and all that. When I thought they were going to be at full strength, I thought they would be the best team in the league and win the championship. And they still may. That's how much talent they have. Uh, but, but I bring it up because a lot has gone wrong since then. Obviously, the injury to Durant. Uh, Kyrie and stubbornness refusing to get vaccinated. Uh, and then Harden, as you, as you mentioned, seemingly has his eyes set in Philadelphia. I think the challenge there, uh, and, and this is where, you know, obviously, the, 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 you know, we are human beings and, and the people doing these jobs are human beings. So I think if you're Brooklyn, uh, your response is, hell no. Like, no, we're not we're not participating in that. We're not engaging in trade talks with Philadelphia. No. You, you know, if this guy walks out the door, uh, he's not going to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I bring that up, CP, is because if you look at the 76ers payroll uh, and keeping in mind, again, not to get too deep in the weeds and technical from a cap perspective, but. If you receive a player in a sign and trade, you're hard cap. There's an apron that you're hard cap that. Mm -hmm. So I bring it up because Philadelphia, there are ways for them to do it. Uh, but Simmons would have to go out. Uh, it may, if Tobias Harris goes out, I think that would do it. But I think it's going to be difficult to move Harris given his contract and productivity. So it means Danny Green and other guys go out. So I, so I bring it up because it's not as simple as um, you know, if Simmons doesn't play this year, Harden plays out the year in Brooklyn, and then he says, I want to be traded to Philadelphia, and, and they do a sign and trade for uh, Ben Simmons with the 76ers and Nets. Um, that, that would not work, it, you know, everything else equal. Uh, Philly would have to make other moves. The Nets would have to participate. So I'm fascinated. One thing that not enough people are talking about nationally that's a real possibility, CP, is if James Harden opts in for next year, so he's got one year left on his deal, but then tells the Nets, I'm not going to re-sign here. Mm -hmm. and, and I bring it up because in that scenario, uh, Harden, and I'm sure his agents know this, uh, could, could you know be an expiring contract. He'd have a lot of leverage with Brooklyn. Get what you can. I'm leaving next offseason. And then try to get traded to Philadelphia then. Again, the Sixers would have to make other moves. And after he waits six months, then he can sign the five-year max extension. So, so that's very interesting. You know, that, that's as much money as he can get. And he could do that if he opted in, then somehow forced a trade to Philly again, which is difficult. But if you could pull it off, you wait six months, he gets five years, $270 million, and seemingly gets to his preferred destination. Interesting indeed. Now, uh, as we record this show, um, the Blazers and the Clippers have made a trade. They sent Norman Powell. The Blazers sent Norman Powell, who they just signed in the offseason, and Robert Covington to the Clippers in exchange for Eric Bledsoe and Justice Winslow. When, when you think about, as you said, potentially CJ going out and how do the Blazers keep Dame happy? Do you read anything into this potential trade and, and how it impacts the Blazers going forward? 
Well, the financial factors here for Portland, too. I'll have to take a closer look at the numbers, CP. The deal just came down in the last hour or so. But I believe now Portland goes from slightly over the luxury tax to slightly under the luxury tax, uh, which is a real factor for a team like the Blazers. Obviously, not a big market team. And frankly, a team that's you know maybe borderline play-in. So mm-hmm. if you go to the owner and, and incur a big luxury tax bill, you, you want to at least be a sure playoff team or hopefully a championship contender. So, so I think that is part of it. Um, you know, Eric Bledsoe has been traded a, a number of times now. Uh, I think it's probably more of a financial deal and also more of a deal um, for in, in that deal. Portland also got Keon Johnson, uh, the first round pick, the athlete. Um, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, teams had some concerns about his position and skill, but he is one of the better athletes to come into the NBA, not just in last year's draft, but in recent years. So I think Portland views it as they get under the tax. They get a look at a young player. Uh, Bledsoe's contract, keep in mind, is only partially guaranteed for next year. Mm-hmm. So I think for Portland, uh, it's more of a flexibility play, um, you, you know, whereas the uh, what they had tried before uh, with the super small lineup with, with Lillard, McCollum, Powell, you know, Covington kind of at the four. Um, it didn't work out great, especially on the defensive end. So I think this is more of a long-term asset play for them. I don't think they necessarily think that, you know, Nor- uh, Norman Powell and Robert Covington walking out the door just for Bledsoe and, uh, you, you know, young Keon Johnson will improve their team in the short term, but it does give them more assets and flexibility for a team that's pretty locked in payroll wise, especially with all the money they're paying to Lillard and McCollum. Now, your former team, the Boston Celtics, uh, another tough season for them, uh, underachieving uh, based on, I think, I think many opinions. Uh, they have the, the, the two J's. They have uh, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, still trying to figure out uh, the direction with those guys. Do you see Boston make, making any moves at, at the deadline? I think they'll make at least one uh, less exciting one because they're another team that's slightly over the luxury tax. So I think they'll move, you know, Bull Bull or PJ Dozier or something, somebody like that to get under the tax. Um, bigger than that, I, I think they'll they'll put Dennis Schroeder in play. I, th- I think Dennis Schroeder is in play. Uh, we'll see what happens with Josh Richardson. He may be playing what in play as well, although he has played better recently and the team has played better. Boston's played a lot better since the calendar flipped to 2022 than they did uh, in 2021, especially on the defensive end. The Celtics are, are much improved, but uh, I think with, with Schroeder, a uh, trade would make sense for everybody involved, CP. Uh, you just signed the one-year deal, which means the Celtics you know, do not have bird rights and the things that you would need to, to exceed the salary cap at a significant level. Uh, also, Boston's payroll uh, next year is, is pretty uh, swell. Keep in mind that they have Jason Tatum at a max level. They're paying Jalen Brown a lot. Uh, Robert Williams, who's played very well and, and on a really good value contract, is still in play. Al Horford has, has at least a pretty significant financial guarantee. So uh, I think the Celtics would look to move Richardson, um, and, and, excuse me, look, look to move Schroeder. And I think that's something, again, Schroeder would want, especially if he goes to a good team, uh, can, can maybe have a bigger role as a scorer off the bench playing mm-hmm. on national TV. And also for Boston, that frees up playing time for Peyton Pritchard. Uh, Pritchard was in the doghouse to start the year. Emi Odoka, the new coach, didn't give him a lot of run for the first month or two of the season. And then sometime in December, he started to play more and played relatively well. So I think Boston resets it that way. I would look at Schroeder going out, maybe Josh Richardson as well, and then potentially a minor piece or two for financial reasons. Interesting. Uh, a couple more quick questions for you. When you see all, you see all the, new, the news and the rumors flying around, the, you know, this team's interested in so-and-so, this team's interested in so-and-so. How much is that strategy? You know, is that agents putting that out there? Is it teams putting it out there? Is it a player putting it out there? So how do you interpret the the news and the rumors as they come through, you know, this 24-7 news cycle that we have now? Yeah, it's it's a challenge. And that's where I think a lot of it is misdirection, right, from from teams. Uh, Especially one of the things that's kind of a tell for me, CP, is when you see that a specific offer is not good enough for a team. Well, who would know that offer other than the team receiving it? And why would they put out there, uh, this is not good enough? For example, uh, we saw recently that um, the Philadelphia 76ers did not think, I think it was something like Jeremy Grant, Sadiq Bay, and Josh Jackson, or maybe Kelly Olenek, some variation of that, was not good enough for Ben Simmons. Uh, personally, I think that's a very good offer for Ben Simmons, and one Philly would have taken if it were on the table, in my opinion. Uh, but, but I bring it up because I think what franchises do is, is use that, or maybe some variation of that offer was made by Detroit, uh, and try to set the bar where other teams say, oh, boy, if they're turning down that offer, well, if we want Simmons, we have to jump over that hurdle and do better. So, um, you know, I, I'd say... Uh, look, 99% of the deals that get discussed do not get done. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, but, you know, it, now if, if you 
uh, believed every rumor than every player in the leagues in play in multiple scenarios. That is really not the case. You know, it's more targeted, more specific than that. Um, so I think from an organizational perspective, you just have your, your you know, front office or your coach, your head coach, even directly address the players. Say, look, it's that time of year, especially the veteran guys who have been through it, know the deal. And then if there is a deal, you will hear directly from us. I think that's the best way to handle it because if you, if you paid attention to every rumor and, and from an organizational perspective, tried to deny every rumor that wasn't true, you'd literally do that all day and have no time to, to do your job or do anything else. As you said, 99% of the deals that uh, get discussed don't get done. How did you as a GM handle not, not getting a deal that, that you may have wanted or a deal that you felt like was really going to help your franchise move forward or a deal that you felt like, you know, you had a great chance of winning. How did you handle that? And just to be able to move on to, 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 to the next. Yeah, it's difficult because obviously the deals that don't happen, especially the ones involving your own players, uh, and, you know, particularly if they're your top players, you don't want anybody to know about, right? You never want that to get back to one of the top guys on your roster. Uh, for example, if, if the Knicks are open to trading Julius Randle and they're close and they think they might have something, but it falls through at the last minute, you'd never want Julius to know that, you know, they, they were about to potentially send him out the door. Um, so I, I think that's it. And, and that the way we tried to handle it, every franchise does it differently uh, in Boston and Phoenix. Uh, you know, I, I tried to have a similar approach working with Danny Ainge in Boston and then uh, being, you know, kind of lead guy in Phoenix is look, um, pay, pay no attention to the rumors. We're get, our job is to do what's best for the team. Uh, if there is a deal to be had or for close to a deal, we will let you know. We'll give you a heads up. We'll try not to have you find out from Adrian Wojnarowski or Chom Sharani, one of these guys on Twitter. The challenge CP now is those guys are so darn good that like it's almost like they have everybody's phone taps and they just get everything right away. So that's one of the challenges. And you see some players get bent out of shape about that. But generally, that's what we tell our players. Um, you know, if, if you're, if you're going to be dealt, you'll hear it directly from us. And, um, you know, we're not trying to, uh, you know, make a bunch of moves. And I, I think the players, especially the veterans know that if the team is playing well, uh, and things are on the up and up, you're less likely to make moves where if the team is underperforming, uh, at this year's trade deadline, again, looking at Sacramento, Indiana, I think the guys in those locker rooms, especially the veterans know that it's more likely that those teams will make a trade or multiple trades, given how the season has gone so far and the underperformance. Tough, tough business, tough business. I give, give you a lot of credit uh, for the success and 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 your resume as well. Uh, it, it's definitely a tough business. Uh, final question for you. Uh, what, what is your your trade deadline prediction? What's your big trade deadline prediction on uh, on February 10th, 3 p.m.? Yeah, Ben Simmons to the Western Conference. Uh, I would look at Portland, the, the deal we laid out uh, earlier in this show. Uh, if, if he's not in Portland, I'd look at Sacramento. Um, you know, we, we discussed them as well relative to De'Aaron Fox and their backcourt logjam. I think he'd be a great fit in Dallas playing off of Luka, but I don't think Dallas has the assets, uh, you know, minus, minus Luka to get involved. And keep in mind, historically, when a star is traded, that team trading him does want to send him to the opposite conference. The reason for that, CP, as you know, is you only play that team twice a year, right. and the only way you'd ever meet in the playoffs is if you meet in the finals, right? So, um, you know, Simmons. Um, I'm also keeping an eye on Jeremy Grant. Uh, mm -hmm. I personally do not think uh, – I think Grant is available for the right price, but Detroit is setting a high bar – from what I'm hearing, I personally do not think James Harden or Bradley Beal will be dealt. Uh, we'll see what happens. But I, I would be shocked if one of those, you know, megastar guys uh, like a Harden, a, you know, surefire Hall of Famers gets traded. I'm looking more at, at Simmons, Fox, Grant, mm -hmm. those kind of players. And then, you know, a team like New Orleans, I think will be active. That's what I have my eye on over the next week. You know, as an admirer of the Denver Nuggets, I wish Grant never would have left. You know, he leaves Detroit for, you yeah. know, uh, supposedly because he wants a bigger role now, now he's potentially on the trading block on a terrible team it, it's just crazy but uh but ryan i definitely appreciate the the insight that you gave us today looking forward to the trade deadline and hoping you join us uh for for the draft show you know we'll, we'll, we'll be looking forward to the draft in the next couple of months and the way the knicks are playing could be sooner than that so looking forward to having having you back on Th thanks again for your time cp i enjoyed it always great to be on with you uh, if you just want to let the people know where they can find you in the next couple of days and, and how they can contact you. Yeah, I'm an Odyssey NBA insider. I know you're doing some work now with Odyssey as well. Obviously, down your way, they have the fan in New York, WI in Boston, WIP in Philly, and a lot of the top stations, especially in the Northeast. So I'll, I'll be on their airwaves a lot over the next week or so. Uh, and then on Thursday live from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern, I'll be in Atlanta covering uh, the, the trade deadline for NBA TV. I did it remotely. I did the trade deadline and free agency last year for NBA TV. Uh, I love the trade deadline live, especially CP, because uh, this is what guys like you and I live for, the action. You don't know what's going to happen. So we'll be on an hour before the deadline till the deadline and then an hour after kind of previewing, breaking news and then breaking down the deals as they happen.
going to be action packed. Uh, I'll be tuning in. Thanks again, Ryan, for your time and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you, CP.